No topic of limits. Breaking down current events, no hose barred. The only show where all viewpoints are welcome. And where you can live chat during the show. You're watching The Attorney's TV Show with your host from the West Coast in Tacoma, Washington, Attorney and Minister Vicki Curry Jackson from the Law Office of Vicki C. Jackson. With your host from the Central Region in West Bloomfield, Michigan, Attorney and Minister Yorina Ricks Johnson from Ricks and Associates. And with your host from the East Coast in Miami, Florida, Attorney, Minister and Registered Nurse Rossi Williams from Rossi Williams Law Group. So watch the Attorney's TV Show, live streaming every Thursday at 7.30 p.m. Eastern Standard Time on the Attorney's TV Show channel on YouTube and Facebook. Follow the Attorney's TV Show channel now so you won't miss one show. And sign up to get a text reminder when the show goes live on Thursday by texting the word The Attorney's TV Show to 833-996-3343. And now, let's join The Attorney's. Hello and welcome to the Attorneys TV show. My name is Attorney Urena Ricks Johnson and I am your moderator today. We have a great show prepared for you. And I'm going to introduce our co-host today, Attorney Rossi Williams. Attorney Rossi from Miami, Florida. How are you today? I am well, Attorney Urena, and welcome to our special guest here tonight. Everyone, make sure you stay tuned in, you share the show now, and that you follow us. We are breaking this down, no host barred, and it will be a treat. Yes, it will be. And also, we have another attorney that's a part of our show, Attorney Vicki Curry Jackson, who recently lost her husband. But we are in prayer for her, and we are excited for her to return to our show. Today, we have a special guest. We have Levi Todd, who is from my home state of Michigan, and he's here today. He's going to help us break down this topic that we're going to discuss. Levi, how are you today? I'm doing well. I'm doing well. It's really good to be here. Thank you so much for having me, Attorney Ch Johnson. Okay, we're going to we're going to move forward. But before we move forward, we want to make sure that you follow us on the Attorneys TV Show on our YouTube channel, on Facebook, and also we ask that you log on to our website and let us know how you how you feel about our show on WatchTheAttorneys.com. I know you have heard about the current events concerning the restrictions that are starting to happen within our nation. We are hearing on the news about mass mandates across the United States. We're hearing about vaccine requirements. And today we're going to talk about mass mandates, vaccine requirements. Have they gone too far at the federal and the state level? And we have Levi Todd today who is going to talk to us about the college students' perspective from the perspective of mass mandates as well as vaccine re requirements. The first thing I want to talk about is I want to ask our, my fellow attorney about these restrictions. Do you feel the government at the state and federal level has gone too far with these restrictions, Attorney Rossi? I do, depending on which state we're referring to. You know, of course, I am in Florida, and I do believe we have gone too far. You already know I am not a fan of government overreach in any type of capacity. So I believe that we have to balance the rights of the individuals versus the public health emergency that has been going on for such a protracted length of time. I do believe that the federal government has gone a little too far in just requiring a uh, mask in all situations as it did previously, but then it seemed to kind of step back and understand the distinction between the federal government's reach versus the state's rights. However, 
there are many states, including mine, which seem to have politicized the situation. So I believe initially the government went too far, but now uh, I believe the government is going to have to step in from a federal perspective because this is a public health emergency. It is a global pandemic and it has become a political fight as opposed to worrying about the rights of individuals. I, I tend to agree with you, Attorney Williams. I, I think that the public health issue is still here. And I, I believe that we need to concentrate on that when we're looking at what is being passed, when it comes to masks, when it comes to the vaccine. The research has shown that with the mask and if they are worn properly, that it has reduced the spread of COVID-19, as well as with vaccines, the, the vaccine that, that has been developed over this period of time has shown and proven to reduce the spread of COVID-19 as well. So I think that we need to concentrate on the science, we need to concentrate on the public health issue that is in front of us and move forward with trying to get through this pandemic and not make it where we're making it a, a political issue. And I think that's what it's become. I know today we're going to talk even further and we're going to talk about it at the the college student level, which a lot of times I think that we don't really realize that a, a lot of the college students that are going back to school, they're having to deal with these new restrictions. But first, before we go into it, we're gonna watch some footage on some of the college students reactions to masks as well as vaccines. College students in our area though, are upset that they have to be vaccinated in order to go back to campus this fall. The University System of Maryland made that decision to require vaccinations last month. WMH News' Mark Roper is outside Towson University right now, which is in the university system. So Mark, what are their concerns about the vaccine and having to inform the university that they've gotten it? Yeah, good morning, Christian. You know, some are concerned that the FDA has only given emergency use authorization to those vaccines, although some of the protesters say they actually got vaccinated themselves. They just want it to be their choice. Now, the purpose of the student rally in Annapolis is to send a message to administrators with the University System of Maryland. Demonstrators want the university system to reconsider its COVID-19 vaccine mandate for students, and their protest signs carry that message as well. Students held signs which read, what happens to my body, my choice, or forced consent is not consent. Well, last month, the University System of Maryland announced its decision to require students to get vaccinated with exemptions, exemptions allowed for medical and religious reasons. Administrators reached the decision to have a mandate after several colleges across the state battled outbreaks of the virus on campus. I'm so excited to talk to today to a college student at the University of Michigan. He is um, a progressive college student. He is the student body president at the University of Michigan Flint, as well as he has been involved in the political arena. So he can give us a political perspective. He's worked with the office of Governor Whitmer, our current, our current governor, as well as the congressman with the United States as well. So we're going to get your perspective today. Um, Levi, can you give us your perspective on whether your the University of Michigan, first, let's start off with the University of Michigan, is there mass mandates within the University of Michigan? Absolutely, there is. There is a mass mandate at the University of Michigan. On July 30th, uh, President Slichel, president of the University of Michigan, issued a uh, campus, uh, all three campuses, required all three campuses to um enforce mass mandates and so if you are in any buildings at the university you have to wear a mask and if you are not you will be removed from the facilities um when you are outside you do not have to wear a mask and you, but if you are not fully vaccinated you do have to um social distance okay do you feel like these mass mandates are an infringement on your individual right as a as a college student to roam freely within the campus? I know college is one of the best years of your life, you know, in, in college. So, you know, do you feel like this is too restrictive for you to to have this mass mandate in place while you're while you're on college, the college campus? 
Well, I see how it can feel restrictive and how students would love to roam freely, but this is a matter of public health. And this is something that um, we have to take seriously. We have to follow the science. The science shows that masks protect protects us. And college students, we're always doing something. We're over here and then over there. And um, we're close to one another. And we have to wear a mask so that our um, these particles are not jumping on each other. And COVID-19 is it is it is getting out of control and we have to as students we have to come together and it's we've made it to a political issue as attorney williams have stated it's just become political and not and not so much of public health and so um many students feel as um that they want to wear a mask they're okay with wearing a mask and yeah sometimes it's uncomfortable it's a little itchy sometime but they know that it, it, it is what our doctors with what the CDC recommends, and we're going to follow this policy. Okay. Now, we know that most college campuses have taken it a step further when it comes to the vaccine, and they made the requirement for if students are to stay on campus, that they have to, you know, take the vaccine. Um, does your school have a vaccine requirement? Yes, we do have a vaccine requirement. So Michigan was actually the first school uh, university in the state of Michigan to lead the vaccine requirement uh, for to come back to campus this fall. And um, and so a lot of times um, it was a, it was a hard decision the University of Michigan had to make. But we follow Michigan Medicine, who has actually been leading the state's response to the COVID nineteen pandemic, and um, Michigan. Me me Michigan Medicine recommended that all students will receive a vaccine. Okay, now, how has that come with the, the campus? Has that produced a lot of resistance? Have, have they been complying? What, what, have you, what have you seen on the University of Michigan campus concerning this mandate? It's actually interesting. So each campus is a little bit different. Every campus is unique to one another. At the Flint campus, I can say, we have not gotten a lot of pushback about it. Many students want to, they follow the science. They see that wearing a mask and getting shots in arms are the tools we have to get out of this pandemic. And students want to be in the classroom. They want to they want to go to in-person activities. They want to be on campus. And if the university, so the university, we pay $14,000 in tuition a year to go there and to get that education they set forth these policies and we have to follow them and if we want to we want to be like we want to be in the classrooms and so um getting shots in arms that's what we have to do we have to do it and the the pub the response has been just it's been so interesting because you have some students who have actual um, concerns about the vaccine and but the university we have an exemption process so if you have medical reasons or if you have religious reasons or if you're fully online you if you're fully online it is okay you can stay online you do not have to get the vaccine but if you want to come to campus if you want to go in the classroom with other students you have to get vaccinated and that's what we're encouraging so do you do you feel like that's an infringement on individual rights or is the public health still outweighs that risk with the vaccine? I really believe that the public health outweighs. I do not believe that um, it impedes the rights, the individual rights, um, because like I said, like we choose to go to the University of Michigan. I chose when I graduated from high school, I chose to go to U of M, one of the greatest institutions in the world. And um, when I graduate, I'm going to have that great U of M degree. And um, and so and I agreed to follow the policy set forth by the university. And like, like, like I said, like, I know these are the tools that we have um, to fight this pandemic, to fight this virus. And, and until we get other, uh, some more tools, this is what we're going to have to use. Okay. So we've been talking a little bit about individual rights versus the public, you know, the public concern. Um, Attorney Williams, can you give us a little bit of information about some of the claims of individual rights that can be asserted by individuals in opposition to that to the vaccine or mass mandates? Well, definitely, especially here in Florida, one of the main rights we have seen asserted is the rights of parents, uh, because in our schools, of course, our governor has said 
that the schools cannot require masks. We're not even talking about vaccinations because of course, a lot of the children are not able to be vaccinated yet at this point. And as parents, parents have a fundamental right to be able to direct the lives of their children. There's also people who are asserting an uh, invasion of privacy type of claim, saying that making them have to be vaccinated is an invasion of their privacy. So these are the main issues that we are seeing wherein people are asserting their rights not to follow the mask mandates or not to be vaccinated. As Mr. Levi just said, there are people, of course, who have religious reasons for exemption and who have medical reasons. You know, I've, I'm also a registered nurse and I've been a nurse for over 20 years in addition to being an attorney. And so there may be medical contraindications in which a person cannot receive the vaccine. But in general, it's the fundamental right of parents or an invasion of privacy is what we're seeing most often. Government overreach. <laughs> Yes, and we and we have talked extensively about how you know that's something that that's like a red flag for us government overreach. <laughs> but we're going to continue talking about the state of Florida. But first, we're going to look at some more footage. First tonight, when it comes to masks in schools, the governor is doubling down. He says students shouldn't be forced to wear masks. Parents obviously can equip their kid to go to school however they want, uh, but there shouldn't be any coercive mandates. But as COVID cases surge in the state, some doctors are questioning his pandemic response, and they want the governor to focus more on the vaccine. Fox 13's Aaron Mesmer is joining us now live in Tampa. And Aaron, take us through these physicians' concerns today and what they said. Yeah, hey, Kelly, we, we've heard the governor over the last few weeks talk about several different topics, but these three doctors who participated in this uh, virtual meeting today want him to focus primarily now on COVID-19 again. They don't think the governor is doing enough to slow the spread of this Delta variant. Every conversation should be about COVID right now. COVID-19 is surging again. Healthcare workers find themselves back on the front lines, and at least three of them, including St. Petersburg immunologist Dr. Mona Mangan, feel Governor DeSantis isn't doing enough to help. So this is the time to double down, get back into the business of this and uh, stop politicking around and start doing some real science and saving lives. Mangit, along with Dr. Bernard Ashby, a cardiologist in Miami, and Dr. Frederick Southwick, an infectious disease specialist in Gainesville, held a virtual news conference Thursday. They say vaccine confidence is in desperate need of a boost. They don't trust the vaccine. They don't trust what we're saying about the vaccine. They don't and while the governor has consistently urged the public to get vaccinated, these doctors feel the message gets muddled. They believe DeSantis' sharp criticism of Dr. Anthony Fauci, the nation's leading infectious disease expert, his cruise line lawsuit against the CDC, and his public criticism of national efforts to slow the spread are exacerbating vaccine. Attorney Rossi, your state has been in the middle of a, a lot of controversy, a, a, a lot of things. So we want to get your current perspective of what's going on. What is the current status of the governor's mass ban in Florida? Right now, the governor has prevailed in his emergency appeal up to the first district court of appeal. So there was a court, what we would call a lower court legally in the second circuit who agreed with the school districts and said that the governor's mask mandate ban was overreach. He was, it was unconstitutional. The governor's attorneys appealed that to the first DCA, the first district court of appeal. And right now, although the entire fight is not over, the governor has prevailed in that the lower court's ruling has been stayed. So that just means in layman's terms that the governor's ban against mask mandates is back in effect. However, what is interesting is that quite a few of the school districts are not complying with the first DCA's ruling in this matter. Here where I reside in Miami-Dade County, the school district still requires masks, and that is our largest school district in this state. In our neighboring Broward County, where you have Fort Lauderdale, that school system also is not complying <laughs> with the first DCA. 
So the governor has won temporarily on a legal standpoint, but the schools are not backing down. They are requiring the students and educators to wear masks. Now, do you do you believe that that will affect the funding that the school receives based on the defiance of the current mask, the ban that the governor has imposed? From a state level, yes, because that is part of the consequences that Governor DeSantis put into his ban against the mask mandate would be that if a school system failed to comply, that school system would lose state funding. However, the Biden administration has put some type of funding in effect for those school districts so that they could tap into federal funds. And what is also interesting is that now the Office of Civil Rights of the U.S. Department of Education has sent a letter to Florida as well as some other states saying that they're investigating these bans by the governor from a standpoint of discrimination against students who are disabled. So what they're saying is that these students have a right to in-person education and that the cost the governors are saying that the schools, the students can't wear masks. This is infringing on their rights to be at school because the disabled kids cannot be in those high risk or high compromise situations medically. Wow, wow, that, that is such a great point. I know here in Michigan, just to give my perspective on the, the mandates here. Now, specifically in Oakland County, there has been a mass mandate with all the schools in Oakland County, and I have a seven-year-old son, and I know that the decision was made for me to, and my husband, in order to send him back to school, was partly based on the fact that the mass mandate was in effect. I felt a lot more comfortable with sending him back to school based on the fact that I knew that they were going to take, the school was going to take certain precautions. I did not feel like that I was, my rights, my husband's rights and my rights were infringed upon by not being able to make that decision and that the school district made that decision. I think that it's still a matter of public health and I am in agreement with the school district in my situation, making that decision for masks because it definitely made the made it worth it for me to send my son back to school because other than that i don't think that we would have sent him to in-person learning mm -hmm. so i think a lot of students and a lot of parents take into consideration on whether that mask mandate is is there because i also understand that you know he is around um grandparents he's around other people and he cannot get vaccinated so mm -hmm. i i do think that the public health of him wearing a mask, even though it's hard to keep it up, <laughs> you know, but I, I do think that requiring that is important. But there is a, a, a definitely a school of thought that should parents have the final say in whether a student should wear a mask or not. Attorney Williams, I know you touched on a little bit. Can you give us a little bit more information about your feelings toward that? Oh, definitely. Legally, <laughs> you know, parents do have the right to, again, the fundamental right to direct their children. But we have to remember that those rights are not an absolute. For example, a parent just can't send his or her child to school wearing whatever clothing the parent may want his or her child to wear. The parent can't send the child to school doing any kind of thing or saying any kind of thing. So in other words, yes, you have rights, but there are limitations to those rights. In this situation, what really has bothered me is that I haven't been able to follow the reasons from the parents as to why they don't want the kids to wear the mask. Now, for me, if you were saying the kids were required to be vaccinated prior to the vaccinations being approved, I would have agreed with the parents because you know, I would not even take the vaccination initially because it only had an emergency use approval from the FDA, which is not the same as having the full approval. And so I said, I need to wait and see <laughs> how the clinical trials roll out from all of the public <laughs> taking the vaccination because those for me were the clinical trials. But once we got to the point where the FDA had approved these medications and we also were seeing all these mutations such as the Delta variant, then I said, okay, I'm ready and I was vaccinated. But that's something going into my body. 
for me, that's a whole different level of you just saying, I need you to put on a mask. And that's how I see it here with the parents in the schools. If the schools were mandating that the children must take vaccinations, which had not yet been fully approved, I would fight with the parents all day because there's no way you're going to let my child be the guinea pig or the lab rat for that. However, if the school is only saying you have to wear a mask, I really don't see how the parents have that final say. And even though the first DCA here has temporarily ruled with the governor and saying the parents have, quote, choice, unquote, I want to see how this is going to fall out on the end. And again, I just don't follow the parents. I, I respect the parents. And you know, here on this show, we break it down no holds barred. We are respectful, but we're not here just to agree with people. So I respect the parents and their rights, but I don't understand what their argument is. Unless you can tell me you have full authority and final say to do anything you want regarding how you send your kids to school, what they must do, then don't come and say to me that you got the final authority regarding the mask. You can't even have final authority regarding where your kids go to school. You can send your kids over here in the school and say to you, you don't live in the correct neighborhood to even allow your children to come here without some kind of variance and you will comply. Your kids can't wear a crop top or a little shorts and you will comply. So what is the issue here? I think it is that this has become a political situation. Kids have to be vaccinated, parents comply. Kids have to be at school at a certain time, parents comply. If you don't send your kid to school for a certain number of days, you can be charged with juvenile delinquency as a parent. You can have your parental rights terminated. They comply. So what is the issue here with wearing a mask wherein your kids don't even have really a say and they are relying on you? I'm going to be quiet because the more I talk about it, the angrier I get. <laughs> Because kids are missing school. Yes. And when the schools close down, I'm sorry, Attorney Yurene, I know you're hosting tonight. Just bear with me. <laughs> but when these schools close down, that means that children are sent back home to virtual learning, which has already been shown by pediatricians and psychologists, as well as psychiatrists, not to be the most effective way of learning for them. This means they're put behind the eight ball regarding their education. And for children in rural areas who may not have constant internet access, children who live in homes where there may be three or four children and they don't all have a separate bedroom to share, then this adversely impacts their education. And it's a time that you can't get back. So I take issue with these parents politicizing this and no, they should not have the final say. <laughs> That's how I feel. And 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 I, I tend to agree. I, but there is a school of thought that says that the masks provide psychological damage to children. That by having the mask on, that it muzzles the children, it prevents them from being able to be free in the classroom. There has been studies of the psychological evaluation with depression among college students, as well as among younger students based on the fact of having to wear masks. Now, I'm gonna, I'm gonna turn to our guests. Uh, I know that on the college campus, there has been a lot of, the suicide rate has, has, has definitely went up since COVID-19 hit. There has been you know, a lot of anxiety. There's been a lot of things. Do you think that the, the masks Wearing a mask provides some type of, and I know we're not speaking as psycho, uh, as psychologists or anything like that. I'm giving that disclaimer, <laughs> but but I just want to, you know, from your perspective, Levi, have you seen, you know, more college students dealing with depression and things of that things of that nature? And do you think that it's connected to wearing the mask? Well, thank you for that question. I think it's a really good question. Um, a lot of uh, I've noticed um, there's been a mental health crisis in, in, on the college campuses, especially during, throughout the COVID-19 pandemic. Um, depression has skyrocketed, um, but I don't know if it's connected with masks. Um, I think that I, I do miss seeing people's smiling face and seeing teeth when you smile, but I 
don't think it's connected with masks. I think more it's connected with the pandemic and how secluded we've all been for the last 18 months. We have been at home. Many students had to go back home and live with their parents. They were not allowed to live in the dorms. They were not allowed to be in the classrooms. They were not allowed to be with their peers. You know, it was, you were separated. Everybody had to go home into their own little igloos and their own worlds. And, you know, it's, it, it's kind of sad. And so now we have this, um, this opportunity to get back in the classrooms and get back in in, um, in full swing of things if we wear a mask. I don't know about you, but I'm happy to wear a mask. If that means I can go to class, if that means I can hang out with my friends and go into restaurants and have a good time, that's what I'm going to do. And I think a lot of a lot of other students at the University of Michigan feel the same way. Okay. All right. We appreciate that. My last question, I'm going to go into is that you know attorney rossi williams and i are licensed ministers and we always like to give some type of advice to the churches i've seen recently that some churches have imposed vaccine requirements for in-person worship i've seen a lot of a lot of churches do that i've seen them online you know require proof of vaccination cards before you are able to enter from churches to popular music festivals, we are seeing more and more vaccine requirements popping up all across Metro Atlanta with no sign yet that our surge in COVID cases is slowing down. Brittany Klein Peter now kicks off our team coverage as DeKalb County and a church tells its parishioners no vaccine, no service for you. Atlanta alone has more than half a dozen mega churches. Some of them averaging more than 10,000 parishioners on any given Sunday. Those high numbers combined with the spread of the Delta variant are now prompting some faith centers to take extra safety steps. We are not apologizing for being the most conservative and the most cautious during this period. Piney Grove Baptist Church in DeKalb County says it's requiring worshipers to sign a waiver, get their temperature checked, and show proof of vaccination before attending in-person services. We said we were going to follow in-person, in-person worship. Attorney Rossi Williams, tell us your perspective on that. Should churches require for in-person learn, I'm, I'm sorry, in-person worship vaccines? I would totally disagree. You know, I'm vaccinated, but I don't take my vaccination card around with me. And I would never go anywhere that would require me to have to show my vaccination card. So I wouldn't even be visiting New York <laughs> anytime soon. Just like I feel vaccine passports are government overreach and a very slippery slope, because once you open that door, how far does that go as to what you have to show? I feel the same way with churches. Now, my question would be, uh, are the pastors going to show me their vaccination cards? Are the choir members, the deacons, the ushers? Because that's really, for me, the nonsensical uh, logic of this, or really I should say the fact that it's illogical. You have the people saying to everyone who's coming in, make sure you show us that you're vaccinated. But we don't know that the people who are in control are vaccinated. It's kind of like going to a restaurant. You want to see my vaccination card, but are you going to show me the vaccination card of the cook, my server, and everyone else? Because if it's that important, it should be important for all. So I believe the churches should make sure that they maintain the social distancing, the temperature checks. They should ensure that everyone wear masks, that the people are at least six feet apart. They should do those things because those things are not intrusive, nor are they invasive. And they are recommendations from the CDC and they've been shown to work. But I think be careful, you know, of that slippery slope. That's my perspective on it. I, I tend to agree. I think that that is, would be definitely an overreach. I, I know a lot of churches that have done it. And I just think that that's getting into too of an evasive way to monitor people as they come into your church. And then also, I think that it does not promote people wanting to visit your church, you know, or just, just the, the open door environment that you want to create within your, your congregation. I do agree with attorney Williams that we do need to have those restrictions in place that have 
kept us safe, which would be the social distancing and the, the mask, the mask requirements when you're in the sanctuary. But I do think that it's definitely an overreach to require vaccines. We've had definitely a great show today. And we always want to end with a word of prayer um, to pray for our nation. And we know that a lot of people are hurting and a lot of people have been dealing with COVID-19 for a long time. And we all have dealt with it for a long time, but we want to make sure that we provide prayer on tonight. So we ask that you bow your heads. God, we thank you for your goodness and your mercy. We thank you for your love and kindness. God, we ask that you touch each and every viewer. God, we ask that you touch each and every co-host. God, we ask that you meet everyone at the point of their needs. God, some people are hurting. Some people are feeling the effects of COVID-19. God, we ask that you uh, we know that you are a healer. We know that you are a deliverer. We know that you are everything that we need, God. We ask that you be everything that we need in our lives. And we look to you by faith. In Jesus' name, we pray. Amen. Amen. We've had another great show and we are so excited. We ask that you continue to follow us on the Attorneys TV show on our Facebook page and on YouTube. Make sure you type in the comments that you enjoyed this show, that you enjoyed our guests. Levi, thank you again for joining us, for bringing us this college perspective. It has been invaluable. You are definitely a leader in your community. We, we encourage you to continue to lead at the University of Michigan and be that example. We are so glad that you joined us on today. And we are so excited. We're going to we ask that you tune in with us next week. You just watched another exciting broadcast of the Attorney TV Show. Live streaming every Thursday at 7.30 p.m. Eastern Standard Time on YouTube and Facebook. Breaking down current events, no holds bars. With your host from the West Coast in Tacoma, Washington. Attorney and Minister Vicki C. Jackson from the Law Office of Vicki Curry Jackson. From the Central Region in West Boonville, Michigan, Attorney and Minister Marina Ricks Johnson from Ricks and Associates. And from the East Coast in Miami, Florida, Attorney, Minister and Registered Nurse Rossi Williams from Rossi Williams Law Group. So save the date and don't miss it. Follow the Attorney's TV Show channel on YouTube and Facebook and sign up to get a text reminder every Thursday when the show goes live by texting the word The Attorney's TV Show to 833-996-3343. Learn more and contact the attorneys for representation on their website, watchtheattorneys.com. See you next Thursday on The Attorney's TV Show. Don't miss it.